Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Creative Financing and M&V, How to Sell Your CFO on Energy Efficiency Projects. I'm Ann Vasquez, the editor of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by Lucid. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First, please note the control panel that is on your screen. This is where you can submit questions via the question box in that panel. And you can send these questions in at any time, and our speakers will address them after the presentation. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of that control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the panel, so please be sure it's expanded so you can access the question box. Uh, and if any time you experience a technical difficulty, please send a message to us via that question section also. Uh, now let's get started and meet today's speakers. Your first speaker today is Joe Amador, Director of Product at Lucid Design Group. In his position, Joe guides the product strategy for Lucid's energy management software solutions. He's a subject matter expert in sustainability and energy issues with 10 years of experience in consulting and software product management, sales, and implementation. He has experience leading the development of national and corporate greenhouse gas inventories, and he has been published in leading industry magazines and journals, and has also been a presenter at numerous green business conferences. Your second speaker today will be Doug Golden. He's the Director of Business Development at Metris Energy, and his responsibilities there include direct sales of energy efficiency projects to large commercial and industrial customers. Prior to joining Metris, Doug served as the Managing Director and Co-Founder of NRG Energy Inc. Business Solutions Group, where he led the development and sale of products and services, including large-scale distributed generation, such as solar and combined heat and power, demand response and energy efficiency to national retailers, restaurants, hospitality, and commercial real estate clients. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Syracuse University. So before we get started uh, with our speakers, we do have a poll question that we'd like to ask you to vote on. It will give us a bit of a uh, look into our, into our audience here. Uh, so the question is, how many of the upgrades that you have performed in the past five years had performance guarantees or uh, M&V involved? And please select one of the following. Almost none of those, um, about half, or almost all. If you just take a few seconds to cast your vote, we'll review the results in a few moments. Okay, so just about half, 51% say almost none, uh, with the with another quarter of you saying about half, 21%, uh, almost all. So uh, thank you for voting, and I'll now hand it over to Joe Amador. Joe? Thank you very much, Ann. Welcome, everyone. We appreciate you joining us today. I wanted to first speak a little bit about why efficiency projects are important, uh, why this, this issue is one that should concern you and, and you should be aware of. And it's, it's mainly because, as we all know, buildings drift. That's the term that we use in the industry. And, and what that means is you may have a building, it may be commissioned, it may be recommissioned, retro-commissioned, uh, but if you leave that building a year later, it won't be as efficient as it was when it was first commissioned or went through that commissioning process. Uh, and, and there's a lot of studies out there uh, uh, about this. Uh, that show that buildings are drifting, buildings just based, based on the, the annual, or the, the, the regular use, uh, things will become less efficient. Uh, so efficiency projects are a great way to bring buildings back into uh, a, an optimal operational, uh, identify the inefficiencies and repair them, and then understand what is that savings, both what is the energy savings, what is the dollar savings, and then what's the ROI, how much money are we getting from our investment of, of efficiency projects. And that's a very important point. What we'll talk about today is financing opportunities, financing strategies to actually invest in these projects, also ways to compel and convince other executives within your organization to sign off on these projects. Uh, and then we'll also talk about some of the, the basics of measurement and verification, because measurement and verification itself is, is a fairly uh, challenging concept. Uh, it's, it's a little bit confusing, but we want to add some simplicity and make it really crystal clear to you. So, so moving forward, uh, you know, one of the big questions that comes up is how do you convince your CFO or other finance official, maybe it's the VP of finance, how do you convince them that these projects need to be undertaken? And, and there's a lot of reasons why that's challenging to do. Uh, 
So let's first talk about the status quo. Let's talk about what's happening in buildings, how are they being run today. The, the key point moving forward uh, is, is that managing buildings is pretty costly. And I wanted to show this slide before turning it over to Doug. I wanted to show this slide because many people think of an efficiency project as an energy savings venture. I invest money, I save energy, and I hopefully will save more energy in the first couple years than I spent on that project to, to begin with. But there's a lot of other reasons why efficiency projects are important. Here we're showing across a variety of verticals how much is spent on energy per square foot. That's a pretty key metric used in the industry, energy cost per square foot. But what's also facility cost per square foot? And in all cases, you spend more on your facility. That includes the repair of equipment, buying new equipment, managing or the staff to manage all this equipment. In, in all cases, those, those costs are much higher. And when compelling and convincing the CFO and the finance department that an efficiency project is worthwhile, not only should you be looking at the measurement and verification of the energy, but it's also important to consider, will this new equipment re result in less maintenance? Will it result in more automation so I don't need to have a staff person go in and, and manage things every week or every day? Uh, so that's staff time that I'm saving. And because of all of those, those points, there's a lot of opportunity to save and to make your building run more efficient uh, through an efficiency project, through the retrofit of, of different equipment that may not be a direct energy savings cost. Uh, so with that, to talk a little bit more about the status quo, I wanted to turn it over to Doug. Thanks, Joe. So as Joe mentioned, um, managing buildings is, is very costly. And a recent survey that was done, uh, just over a third of folks said that their capital budgets would not increase or would increase for, for 2015, meaning two-thirds of the people out there running buildings aren't having more money in their budget to do so than they were the year before. Um, so when you look at energy projects, um, we, we look at projects both on an energy savings and a, an operational savings uh, piece as well. Uh, increased regulations are also driving up costs of operating the building. There's increased regulations around energy benchmarking. There's now uh, just over a dozen cities throughout the U.S. that require mandatory benchmarking for, for commercial buildings. That number is expected to grow um, as, as that sort of momentum uh, continues across the U.S. And, and it's a way to separate uh, one building from another as tenants look to uh, lease spaces that are, that are the most efficient and the most cost effective for them and their businesses. There's CO2 reduction targets uh, that are in place throughout the U.S. and in various cities. Uh, and then the high cost of the, of the dollar. So uh, a strong dollar um, is, is, is leading to profits being eroded by, by many S&P companies um, this year due to foreign operations. Uh, with all of that said and, and that folks are stockpiling cash, Nobody wants to spend that cash or their CapEx budget on measures to decrease operating costs. And the opportunity cost of doing that doesn't make sense to most CFOs. Uh, operating costs are, are very hard to quantify, uh, with the exception of um, you know, real maintenance costs on an old piece of equipment uh, that you can show. Um, you know, and those may be repeatable or service contracts. It's, it's very hard to quantify uh, where, the, where the operational ineff uh, inefficiencies are um, in your in your organization, energy efficiency projects in general are a tough sell to CFOs. They rarely uh, main a, they're not a priority when approving budgets. They they divert money away from the core business. Folks that that have a tremendous stockpile of cash would much rather use that cash um, to increase. Uh, if you're a retailer, let's say you would you'd use it to to build more stores or to increase your inventories. If you're a commercial real estate developer, uh, there's still some great buying opportunities out there um, in, the, in the real estate world to, to invest in and, and develop new properties. Um, there's usually greater ROI projects to fund before doing energy retrofits. All of these things lead to CFOs uh, looking at projects and, and typically diverting money away uh, to do something else core to the operation of the company. The three main reasons that we see that efficiency projects don't get on, undertaken 
hurdle rates and time to pay back. This is the, the biggest thing that we hear from folks all the time is, is it doesn't meet their hurdle rates or the payback period is too long. Though it may be a meaningful project, the payback period is, is further than what we can accept um, to use our own corporate cash. Lack of trust in energy savings numbers from vendors. So folks say that the project will save X. How do we really know? That's their numbers. Uh, that it's not proven. Who's going to take on the, the risk on that? And, and more importantly, um, who's going to actually measure and verify after the fact that the project saved what we thought it was going to save? And finally, there's just no budget. So, you know, some people have no budget for projects. Some people don't have enough budget for projects. Um, but typically, you know, with operational costs rising and operational budgets not increasing at the same pace, uh, more and more money that may have been spent in the past on CapEx for efficiency projects is now getting diverted just to keep the operation going. Creative financing. So in this section, we'll look at some financing solutions. So kind of the, the, the traditional financing versus um, some alternative methods of financing out there. Uh, that folks can access to get projects done. So some traditional financing options, loans and leases, fairly straightforward. Loan, you know, go to the bank, take out a loan, go to your banker. Um, leases, there's capital leases, operating leases, typically offered by equipment manufacturers, uh, both of those being on balance sheet options, uh, so that debt would show up on your balance sheet. Uh, capital expenditures, dipping into corporate cash and just writing a check for for the project. Uh, by far, probably the cheapest option for a lot of folks if, if you're cash rich, but uh, again, then you're you're laden with the paybacks that are demanded by your, your finance organization. And bonds, if you're uh, uh, particularly in the, in the municipal space or, or public sector, um, access to the bond market is, is still fairly cheap. Um, so there's, there's bond raises you can do to get large projects done. Uh, however, you know, bond raises are, are typically for much larger infrastructure projects uh, than just the energy efficiency upgrades that you may do. So if, you're, if your organization isn't in the middle of a bond raise already, uh, it would be tough to get a bond raise done. Uh, so an alternative to all of these is the efficiency services agreement. So what is the efficiency services agreement? Um, it's the, the, the agreement that, that Metris has put together, uh, which the customer and the ESCO and Metris come together, um, provide a performance guarantee on the project, uh, and the customer pays Metris on the actual savings of the project. Uh, it's an off-balance sheet solution, so there's no debt, no lease. Um, that goes on the customers. It does not affect the customer's ability to borrow. Um, it's a services agreement, as the name would suggest, just like a utility bill would be. Uh, the, the project is fully funded by Metris. The customer repays over the life of the project uh, at a rate that's discounted to your utility rate, uh, thereby immediately returning OPEX dollars to your bottom line making the project cash flow positive from day one. The ESA really solves all three of the problems of, of why the efficiency projects don't get done. The hurdle rate period is solved. The project becomes cash flow positive from day one. Lack of trust. There's ongoing m and that goes on with every project for the customer to verify savings. And there's no budget needed since Metris funds 100% of project development and implementation costs. Alternative financing has some other benefits as well. There's an, uh, we, we've talked about the avoidance of capital outlay. It eliminates the performance risk since typically ESAs um, across the board will have uh, the customer to pay for performance. Um, so the customer pays on, on actual savings only. The writer of the ESA or the holder of the ESA takes on the performance risk. It's a services agreement with uh, an off-balance sheet solution. Uh, standard utility bill, it looks very much like the bill that you would receive from us on the ESA. Uh, reduces your operating expenses since the ESA price is set below the current utility price. You have an immediate return of OPEX dollars back to your budget. Increased reliability of operations, you're getting new equipment, cuts down on your 
maintenance expenses. Um, and it allows for a rollout of measures across the portfolio uh, in a staged approach. Um, so it's, it's very easy then to get subsequent projects done under the same structure. Now I'll turn it back over to Joe to talk about the M&V portion. Thanks, Doug. That was a great summary of some of the financing options. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about how measurement and verification itself, or M&V for short, helps you sell projects to CFOs. And when we say CFOs, of course, we mean the finance department. We mean other executives, anyone who may not completely understand the energy pieces of what's happening in the building, the energy savings, but is interested in how much are we getting as a return. So we're giving you money and we expect a financial return. So measurement and verification in general, it's an industry recognized methodology. The main methodology, which is what we use at Lucid and that others is, is, use as well, is IPMVP, which stands for International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol. So there's a, a long document, it's about 55 pages, it's a great read, uh, but it, it's all about measurement and verification and it's, it's industry recognized. So any time that you're talking about measurement and verification, it's important to note that this is something that is done across the industry and there is a standard. It's not something, a recipe that you're making up in, in your office that, that sounds good. Uh, in addition, the way it works in general is collecting energy data from the pre-retrofit point. So before we've done anything to our building, collect energy data and then collect other information such as weather, occupancy if you have it, at Lucid, we collect that weather data automatically. If you have occupancy data, we can collect that as well. Uh, but you, you create that, that pre-period or the baseline, and then we use a regression analysis methodology to then build a model of performance of the building. And then after the retrofit has been uh, conducted, we put the current weather data, current occupancy, and other variables into that model, and we get a no improvement scenario. So what we, we end up, with is a model, model generated estimate of had you not made this retrofit or this group of retrofits, your energy consumption would have been X. We compare the X, which is baseline usage, to your actual usage, which should be lower. The difference is energy savings. This is far better than just doing a my bill or my energy consumption before my retrofit and my bill or my consumption after my retrofit because weather uh, weather changes may result in higher use of energy, occupancy changes may, re may result in higher use of energy, and you're not so much looking at energy before I made the retrofit and energy after I made the retrofit. The key point is, what would my energy consumption have been right now had I not done the retrofit, and what was it since I did the retrofit? Um, so measurement and verification allows you to make that calculation, perform that calculation, and what you end up with is an energy savings value, which we then can convert in, in, in building OS into the dollars saved and help you model the actual savings. So if, if we move on, uh, this is a, a, a very interesting uh, and, and simplified way of looking at M&V. I actually found this from a, a, a new, uh, an Australia, New South Wales report. Of all things, they have really good uh, uh, documentation, simple and, and high-level documentation on how measurement and verification works. So just to speak through this real quickly, the seed period is what they're calling the baseline period. So this is before, everything on the left is before you've in invested and implemented your energy efficiency retrofit. Uh, so you ha then have the baseline model, the red, which is built using energy data, occupancy data, weather data, other variables, and our software and other software wants to get that as close to actual as possible. So we want to be able to model energy consumption in the building. We want to va validate that certain variables have an impact. So once we've done that, you have an implementation period. The implementation period is actually when the physical changes are happening in the building. That could be a couple days if it's a no cost or low cost retrofit that involves changing set points. It could be a couple weeks, could be a couple months if it's a longer, more capital intensive project. The reason you want to separate that out is because one, you won't see many much savings until everything's implemented, but B, you may even see a jump in energy because there may be people working late at your office uh, in, installing different equipment, they may be testing equipment, and, and so during that period of time, you, you may not see a, 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 an actual energy reduction, but we want to pull that out. So, so in our product, uh, in Building OS, you're able to designate that period, we can track energy, we can, we can, we can monitor it, but we, we won't be validating the savings. Then after, 
So once we go to this right side, the performance period, the red line is simply the baseline. So that's the model that was created with current weather data, current occupancy data, current uh, other data. It could be production data. It could be square footage data if your building has, has undergone some physical change, it's been expanded. But we can put all of that in and the model gives us estimated energy consumption. So that's that dotted red line. The blue line is the actual use. So that's what you're using. Uh, so all, if all goes well, which typically it does, you'll see a reduction in energy over your baseline and that green middle piece is the savings. So in a nutshell, that's how M&D works. If, if we keep moving, um, now, in terms of, of selling uh, to mem selling projects and using m and to sell to your CFO, uh, you know, we pulled a, a survey here from Verdantix. They're a, an analyst firm in, in the space. And they noted that uh, you know, some of the reasons why it's hard to sell to CFOs, energy management initiatives, how, why is it hard? And you can see that you know, the business case lacks quantifiable benefit. Measurement and verification helps you quantify the actual project. Now, in addition, it can help with these other things as well. Savings that are too small, well, with the ability to quantify the benefits, you have less risk in expanding the project. So you may, may be able to say, instead of changing lights in one building, I'd like to change the lights in five buildings. And that's going to have a much bigger return. We can bring in the contractor to install the lights one time. It's going to be cheaper overall. And we now have a tool, which can be building OS, uh, we now have a tool that allows you to validate the savings. Uh, so measurement verification helps with actually many of these uh, objections, but the one that's in red, business case last quantifiable, quantifiable benefits, is really a, a, a big one. And you'll note that on the, while this is the fourth ranked, in terms of selection of number one, 9% of the respondents selected as number one, but a huge number selected it as number two. So that 34%, this is a real issue. Uh, and, and I would argue that in this list, this isn't really a priority list, but quantifiable benefits should be higher. Uh, moreover, doing measurement and verification in-house is not as difficult as it was in the past. There's a lot of software, including Building OS, that allows you to do your own measurement and verification. We have experts. We also have, uh, have validated our methodology with outside independent uh, uh, groups to, to say that this is a, a, a valid MNV methodology. The numbers you're getting from our product are accurate. Uh, and it can be done, for example, for us in the cloud. So the data can be pulled in, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, and the results can be, can be pushed out. So if we, if we move on, uh, you know, there's, there's a question that sometimes comes up. You know, I have an ESCO, I have an energy service contract, uh, and, and I'm interested in still, why should I conduct m and myself? And ESCO will give you a measurement and verification output. They'll say, we've done m and but uh, you know, with, with software today, you can do m and on your own, and you can do it across many different projects, and it may be advantageous to do that in addition to whatever you have, whatever agreement you have with an ESCO. This can help you tell a story to your CFO because you're getting the data on demand. You have a login, you can get into the software, you can generate a report immediately, you can configure that report, and you can go to your CFO, or if he or she comes to you, you know, you run into your CFO in the hall who says, oh, how's that project going? You can get an answer within five minutes. Uh, you can just log in, get that data. It can be pushed to you on a regular basis. So you're getting information much faster. You're in control of the data. You can do more digging in. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, you can, instead of looking through a report that might be generated and handed to you as a PDF, you can actually immerse yourself in that data uh, in a way that doesn't consume you but allows you to configure and, 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 and be in control. Um, but in addition, you have the ability to, to identify the savings yourself. So you can actually look and, and, and validate which buildings are saving me the most money, which are, are, are not, and having that power in your own hand in a simple and easy way through a, a cloud-based software solution like Building OS is very advantageous uh, in, in, in many ways. So let's move ahead one slide. I, I wanted to highlight very briefly some of the tools that we have in Building OS. So Building OS itself has a measurement and verification application. We can conduct measurement and verification using IPMVP, uh, but we also have what we consider just a, a broader ROI tracking. So tracking what's the return on investment of an entire portfolio worth of projects. And this is just a screenshot we wanted to include. This is, is, is what you get once you've set up a project in, in building OS. So we have, just like in that graph I showed you earlier, we have a blue line that represents 
the actual estimate of what your consumption would have been had you not done a, a retrofit compared to what it actually was, the orange bars. Below, you can see that there's a, a, a return on an investment. That's tracking payback. So at some point, you'll, you'll, you'll provide money up front, and it may be a little bit, but it may be a lot of money. You're, you'll provide money up front, and you'll want to see when do you get a return on, on that. When, do you, when have you paid back that project? So we're tracking that. So the red bars, as you see, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then in, in year two, in this example project, you're now in the green. So you've paid off all the investment, and you're making money off the project. So we can track that. We can also track things like energy savings. We can track CO2 reduced. So your sustainability team may be interested in understanding the, the CO2 savings of a given project so that they can market that, they can publish that. Uh, but we're doing all that based on, in the, in the background, a multivariate regression analysis. So we're taking in a lot of different variables, which include weather. We pull that data from uh, Weather Underground, which is a, 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 a supplier of, of weather data. Uh, we pull that automatically but also occupancy data if you have occupancy. If you don't have occupancy, though, we can use day of week as an analog. So a school that is open on the weekdays but closed on the weekends, we can, we can track that. Um, and then there's advanced baseline options as well. So, so you have the ability to configure and, and change variables. Uh, we'll pick the best variables for you. We'll say these variables seem to build the best model. But you can go in if you'd like and actually say, I actually want to track by, by occupancy because I, I feel that that's, that's the best. So we're making it simple for, for, for novice users or, or those who don't have as much time, but we also want to make it highly configurable for some power users. So what are some of the results? What, what are, um, what, let, let's talk about a case study. So if we move ahead, uh, uh, there's a Fortune 500 media company that we work with, and like many companies, they had a small team, they didn't really have a budget, but they had big energy reduction goals. And they were in the position where they wanted to convince the rest of the organization we actually can save money. Uh, we actually can, can take a little bit of money up front, some upfront capital, and we can save money. Uh, so telling payback and the ability to make this case in a financial uh, business case, uh, they were able to get more money from their finance team. And, and you may find that this is an, a, a, a way to go. You can secure money from a grant, you can secure money maybe from a, 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 a budget that isn't regularly used for efficiency projects, but you can find some, some small amount of money. You can do a pilot project, and then you can prove that savings. You can then convince the executives and, and other stakeholders, the CFO, that actually this is a, a really uh, valid way for us to spend and an advantageous and valuable way for us to spend our money. I also wanted to highlight that one of the key pieces, which I'll talk about in a moment, but, but I wanted to highlight here, they were tracking everything in real time. You don't have to do that, but building us makes it extremely easy to track data in real time. Um, our measurement ver and verification solution allows you to, to get the data on a 15-minute interval basis or even an hour interval basis, and that can, can make for, uh, that it is advantageous because one, you can very quickly identify uh, discrepancies. So if, if you aren't saving as much money as you thought you would save, you can track that after a day or two or three rather than at the end of the month when you've received your utility bill. But everything I've talked about in terms of performing measurement and verification, validating savings, that can all be done with utility bills as well. And, and we, can, uh, we, can, we can use either of those sources of data or we can use both sources of data if certain buildings have real-time energy meters and certain buildings just have a utility bill. Uh, so we prefer and we would recommend using real-time energy data. We think that that is advantageous, and the costs of doing so are actually not as high as you might expect. Um, in fact, they're dropping every day and every week. But at the same time, uh, we understand that in some cases, a utility bill validation approach is, is, is the, the best for your organization, and we can support you in that as well. So let's move ahead to conclusions. Um, and the, 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 the next slide I wanted to highlight, really the, the conclusion here is creative financing and, and measurement and verification go together well. But let's talk about a framework. Let's just how can we easily conduct project measurement and verification? The first goal, or the first step, really, is to understand current building performance. So across your portfolio, it's useful to have a baseline or a, a basis of how much energy is being consumed, which buildings use a lot of energy, and maybe even which buildings are drifting. You'll recall at the very beginning of this webinar, I spoke about buildings drifting. And all buildings drift, but certain buildings are going to drift more than others. So building OS can provide tools that allow you to quickly identify the, the positive performing buildings, the buildings that are not performing as well, 
and that can be on a variety of basis uh, of metrics or, or, or ways. You can look at the EUI, which is energy use intensity, energy per square foot, and you can find the buildings that have the highest EUI or the buildings that have a high, the, the, the most changed EUI from last year to this year or from last month to this month. Energy Star Score is another way. We can automatically report data and collect data to get an Energy Star Score. And you can just look at the buildings that have a low Energy Star Score. Uh, and there's many other ways. You can just look at total energy consumption, uh, maybe total energy cost. We have a rate and tariff engine that allows you to convert that energy data, the kilowatts and kilowatt hours, and turn that into dollars and cents. And you can look at demand charges. So you could say, these five buildings have very high demand charges. I live in an area where demand charges are not only very high, but they're going up. You know, we're moving. I read an article this morning about time of use rates and, and the fact that more and more you will see higher demand charges for use during the middle of the day. So there's a variety of, of ways. But, but using tools in Building LS, using you know, other tools you might have access to, understand current building performance. Uh, additionally, you should understand within your organization the appetite for energy efficiency investment. So, and, and, and that can be based on what have you done in the past, how successful have those projects been. If they have not been that successful, try to figure out why they haven't been so successful. If you've never tried projects, understand why that hasn't happened. I think the Sony or the, the media company case study is extremely important because it, it shows a team that understood what had been done in the past and understood what they could do, uh, what they could do in the future to, to get a project going. So that media company said, we don't have a lot of money. We don't have an appetite to invest in money. So our small team, let's get them together. Let's apply for a grant. And let's use that to prove out that, that we can do this. Considering various financing options. So Doug gave a, a, a great summary of, of how you can secure financing. Financing is, is a great way uh, to, to, to catalyze a project. You, know, you can get that funding. It doesn't have to hit your budget. And then you can prove out the savings. Uh, but then additionally, the last piece, once you've, you've understood what's happening in the organization, what's the appetite, you have financing, you've Im implemented a project, uh, you can then use a robust user-friendly tool, software solution, to actually focus on the results, focus on the energy savings, and actually have a data-driven solution. We talk a lot about data-driven decision-making, which means you understand what's happening, you understand the, the facts on the ground, how much energy are we saving, how much money are we saving, and use that to tell your story. So if, if we move on, we have a, a couple steps, step one, step two, how do we do this? How do we actually put this framework into action? So one step, bundling metering. So uh, a meter is simply a, a small device. Uh, the, the, the thinking in, of the past was that they're very costly, it's a lot of hardware, it's expensive, but um, really uh, we, we, we see those costs dropping, and if you're securing financing for a project, adding a meter is, is probably a very small additional cost. It can be uh, you know, $1,000, 2000 $3,000 in, in that range. It's going to vary, but think in, in that range of, of costs uh, and that, that many zeros behind the number. Uh, but it provides more granular performance data. So you can not only track your measurement and verification project in, in, in real time, in 15-minute intervals, but you'll know when things are going right very quickly, and you'll know thing, when things may not be going right within a couple days rather than at the end of the month and even you know, a month after the end of the month when you get your utility bill. Um, and it's an easy way to, 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 to bundle. If you're already spending money on retrofit, retrofit projects, you can add a, a meter per building, and that meter can be installed, and you can track the, the, the building. The expensive part there is, is usually the labor, but if you already have labor on site, to install lighting or to install uh, variable speed drives or install you know, window retrofits, adding the, the meter may not be such a stretch to add to the, the scope of work. So that's one strong, strong piece of advice I would give in a good first step. If you can't do this, utility bill data can be automatically collected and, 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 and gathered, and, and that will work well. It won't work as well, but it, it will work. Uh, second one, before I turn it back over to Doug, bundling the financing with Measurement and verification uh, is important. Uh, and there's a few ways to do this. You can hire an ESCO. They can handle everything. Typically, you don't have upfront costs for that, but the savings are going to be shared. So if you feel like you're going to save a lot of money in this project, understand that with an ESCO, you will be sharing that savings. You can also self-fund the project. So finding your own funding. The media company I mentioned, they, they found a grant. They were able to gather a grant. 
uh, and, and that was the, the, the funding. It was self-funding, but through a, 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 an external source. And then they conducted the M&V using Building OS, our, our software solution. Um, and then they're able to track this. They're able to tell that story in a data-driven way. But then there's also external financing. So you can secure the external financing. That typically has uh, you know, less, uh, there's less uh, labor on your part to secure the financing. There's less convincing internally to actually get this done. Uh, and then you can conduct that M&V on your own, again, using a software solution like Building OS. So those are, are, are a couple ways to go about doing this. Uh, the, the, the keys are having the data, being able to access the data, and being able to tell that story once you have secured the financing and you've, you've gotten buy-off from the, the stakeholders. Now I'm going to turn it back to Doug for a, a, a step three and a couple more concluding statements. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, so just to kind of wrap up on and, and summarize how leveraging creative financing can maximize approval rates and get projects done, uh, an ESA is a zero upfront cost and helps absolutely just dispel the, the whole notion of a, of a project hurdle rate. Uh, the projects become cash flow positive immediately, um, so there's really no hurdle rate to, to, to overcome. Um, payments are based on the actual achieved savings, so you only pay for, for what you save. Um, you don't get stuck with a project that hasn't performed uh, to the specs that you were promised. Um, if the project doesn't perform, you're, you're not on the hook to, to pay for it. Uh, blending multiple projects, multiple retrofit projects together, so doing multiple ECMs um, to get a blended rate instead of just picking off the low-hanging fruit, uh, which will pass your, your CFO hurdle rates or your finance group hurdle rates, you can tackle some of those longer-term projects that have longer lives to them that may be 20 or 30 year life cycle projects, large chillers or boilers, for example, um, that might have a you know five, six, seven, eight year payback to them um, that wouldn't pass um, but, but would fit into an ESA agreement and continue to deliver savings then for the entire life of that asset. And then high quality M and V tools like building OS um, helps prove out the value of projects, helps scale retrofit programs, helps overcome the fear of how do I really know the project is, is going to save? If I invest money, how do I know the project is really going to save um, you know, what, what we think it's going to save? So really all of those things, um, you know, between the M&V and some financing uh, structures that you may not have explored, those two things coming together uh, really certainly help uh, folks get more projects done and, and more meaningful projects done. And, and with that, uh, I think we can move on to, to questions or back to Ann. Great. Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Joe, uh, for the presentation and that, that information. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in, so we'll, we will uh, jump right into those questions. And please continue to, to send your questions if you do have any. And uh, any that are not answered, we will be answering via email afterwards. So, okay, we'll get right into it. Um, all right, so first of all, we'll start with a, what I would call a kind of an, an overall question is to review how do performance, how do the performance guarantees in the energy services agreement uh, contracts work? Uh, and in your experience, uh, you know, what, what is that process in terms, of, in terms of the stakeholders? Yeah, so the performance guarantees in, in the projects are really between the, the ESCO or the general contractor and Metris, the customer, um, since it's a pay for performance only, um, there are no performance guarantees to the customer. However, the project doesn't save, the customer doesn't pay. Metris wears uh, all performance risk of the project. Uh, so there's really no performance guarantee per se between Metris and the customer, but there's also no expectation of payment um, from the customer to Metris should the project not perform. Thank you. Um, and next, uh, moving to the measurement and verification aspect of this. Um, in terms of measurement and verification, from the, from the outset, you had talked about some pre-retrofit activities uh, and gathering energy data, et cetera. So uh, the facilities person, would they be gathering that energy data uh, in this model that you're talking about? And uh, what kind of energy data should they be gathering at that point? Sure. I, thanks, Ann. I, I can take that one. 
the, the process of gathering data is, it, it can be arduous and it can be somewhat intimidating, but uh, really we try to make that as, as simple as possible. Um, and there's a variety of ways that we can do that. Uh, one, you may have a spreadsheet of utility bills from, from you know, the past year, two years, three years. We can use that. You can send that to us. We can use that. But there's a lot of ways that we can do this without a lot of manual effort. Uh, one can be Energy Star Portfolio Manager. If your building or group of buildings have an account with Portfolio Manager, which is a tool Energy Star is, is using to, to score and, and, and rate and certify buildings, we can actually automatically pull that data. So all we need is your username and password, and you just approve a, a third party like Lucid to access that data. It's very easy to do, uh, and it can be done in, in a matter of minutes uh, as long as that data is in Portfolio Manager. But in addition, uh, we in our software have integrations to many different building systems. Really, at this point, we're at about 150. So any major building automation system, any major metering uh, hardware device, and then a lot of utility bill, uh, utility companies, and then uh, ways to, to access utility bills electronically, and we can gather data in, in, in those ways as well. So we can integrate with your building automation system or your metering. We can pull that data in electronically, and then we can keep pulling it in on a, an ongoing basis. That will give us that historic data, and that will give us the ongoing data that we need. Um, so typically it isn't as, as time consuming as, as you may think. Uh, we, we make it very simple, but we do it every day. Um, this, this comes up all the time for organizations that want to do m &V or organizations that just want to get a handle on, on building performance. Okay. Thank you. So um, what is in, I think this might refer to that bundling financing section that we had toward the end. Um, we had a question here. How much should we spend for measurement and verification as a percentage of overall savings? Um, so yeah, how much should we spend for m and as a percentage of overall energy savings, and what's the range using um, the building's OS, if you could comment on that. Doug, do you want to take that first piece, or, or should I? Uh, go ahead, Joe. Okay. Well, in, in, you know, the, the, the percentage can vary uh, based on a lot of, of different things. My recommendation is, is really when you're discussing an energy project with an ESCO or with a company that, that wants to do a performance contract, you should understand a couple of different metrics. One, current energy performance of the building. So that ESCO or that organization should, should understand you know, what is the average energy consumption per month, what does it look like over the year. And then they should also tell you what will you save, but you should also ask what is the total savings? You know, how much overall will this project save? And then you can do that very basic math to say, well, you're going to save me X, but you're telling me I'm only going to save half of X. So that would tell you that about half of the money is coming to you in terms of savings, and half of the money is, is, is going to, to the ESCO. So it's, I, I think it's important to just have that discussion. That's the best way to uncover from an ESCO point of view how much money you'll save. From a building OS point of view, uh, we are, are just a software company, so we, we have an annual license fee to use our software, which is very inexpensive. Uh, it, it's not related at all to the actual savings, so we don't take a percentage of savings. We aren't taking a percentage of overall energy consumption. We're simply saying to use our product, which includes many more tools than, than just measurement verification, uh, there's a, 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 a charge, um, and, and that charge can be very nominal, and, and in, in many cases, you know, when we look at the media company and how much they save, you know, they save many times the number of, of, of dollars that, that they were, were spending to use the software. Okay, thank you. And to, uh, to, to take a long view again, um, we do have a question here. Why, why would I want to work with a financing partner like Metris instead of working directly with uh, an ESCO? So we see there's three parties in the, in the model you're, you are um, offering here. So, so why bring that financing partner in? Yeah, sure. Um, when you work directly with the ESCO, you have to come up with the capital dollars yourself, and you take on them the performance risk of the project. Um, working with Metris kind of eliminates both of those those two biggest hurdles. One is, um, you know, we provide all development and, and project implementation cost. It's it's 100% uh, funded by Metris. There is no capital outlay for the customer up front. And secondly, Metris takes on full performance risk of the project. You know, again, kind of going back to the if the project doesn't save, the customer doesn't pay. 
um, in our typical structure, the ESCO would, would provide the performance guarantee to Metris, um, which then satisfies uh, a large portion of how we've underwritten the project. Um, and, and then if the project doesn't save beyond that, Metris is in first loss situation. Uh, the customer is, is still not out of pocket. So, you know, in the most extreme case, if we do a project and it saves zero, the customer is out zero dollars and the ESCO would pay Metris for the performance guarantee. So the customer is only ever on the hook for actual savings generated by the project. Uh, if you do the project yourself, you take on the full performance risk of that project. Thank you, Doug. And we actually have a related question to that. Um, is there a maximum amount uh, that Metris could make available? Uh, is there a maximum amount of money that Metris could make available for an energy reduction project? There isn't really. Um, you know, as, as with anything else, we're we're a, a quasi financial institution that deals with typically you know the large commercial lenders, and um, they would much rather put large sums of capital to work than than smaller sums of capital to work. So. Um, you know, in theory, there there isn't a maximum um, that we would look at. Thank you. And to go back to the actual process, uh, we do have a question here. Can you promise a client ongoing commissioning within this framework? Uh, is there ongoing commissioning? I guess to you know uh, avoid that drift that we had all been talking about. So that's a great question, and uh, and also to the, the the individual who posted it. Um, we we have tools within Building OS. Uh, in addition to our measurement and verification solution. So the measurement and verification solution, especially if you're using real-time data, allows you to track very in very great detail down to the day or even down to the hour, is the project saving what we anticipated that it would save. But there's a host of other solutions and, and ways that we can do uh, commissioning uh, in the building. Now, again, commissioning typically involves a commissioning agent. So that's an individual, an independent individual who can do the commissioning. So we don't provide that service, but we provide the software that that individual could use. Additionally, though, that can be very costly. The software that we provide has a variety of tools that allow you to, to ongo on an ongoing basis track the performance and, and commission that building. Uh, and we would be happy to tell you more about how that all works. Uh, but I can tell you that we, we, we utilize that real-time data in many different ways to, one, tell you what's happening in your building very quickly. So if, if a building is drifting week to week, we can track that. Even day to day, we can track that uh, if we have that interval data. But we also can look at schedules. We can look at over time, is a building starting up too early? Is it shutting down too, too, too late? Uh, are your demand charges rising? So are, are you hitting your peak and then the next day hitting a new peak and the next day hitting a new peak and the next day hitting a new peak uh, in the way peak demand charges work? Wherever your peak is throughout that billing period, that's what you pay for the entire month. Um, so you really don't want to keep setting new peaks. You'd like to avoid peaks and, and, and never hit the peak that you, you may have hit in the past. Um, so we can do all of that, uh, and there's a variety of, 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 of ways that you can do that within our product. Great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and then next, uh, you had mentioned uh, different variables coming into play in terms of occupancy and weather, et cetera, at, at the start, and I assume that means ongoing in the in the project. So someone's asking, um, within this framework that we're talking about, how do you deal with, uh, or how would the facilities person and, and um, I guess the companies involved deal with the change, deal with the change of function or space use during a lifetime of a facility if things are changing, you know, as this process has been implemented and this tool has been implemented, how how is that addressed if there's some space changes, function changes, et cetera? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and, and you typically call that within the measurement and verification framework, you would call that an adjustment. So adjustments simply mean we've created our baseline, we have a project, the project is in the performance period, so we're, we're seeing savings, but something changes. The most typical changes are things like an expansion. We have a school over a 10-year life of a project, because we've re retrofitted windows, they're going to be here for a while, uh, the, the building itself expands. When the building expands, you would obviously see an increase in energy. So there is a way within Building OS and a, a framework within IPMVP, the, the measurement and verification standard, there is a, a framework and a, 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 a industry standardized way of tracking that and, and including that in your savings calculations. And that can be the same for, uh, for a, 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 a space change. So this building or this part of the building 
used to have occupancy of 50 people, and now it has an occupancy of 100 people. So we can model that as well, or, or add that to our model to track and to, to, to in, incorporate into the, the validation. Thank you. And uh, along those lines, I would have a question here. Uh, if you could provide in for insight on a typical payback of one of these projects, I understand there's probably many variables, but um, is there a typical payback or maybe some examples you can give? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you're right, it, it varies quite a bit. Um, but I can tell you that, that there are, and I actually was reading a report just yesterday, I think, from, from a, an organization uh, that, that was looking at different different payback periods, and, and, and their point was that there are certain types of retrofits that may not be uh, the most top of mind that can lead to a, a, a very impressive payback. Um, but, but it noted things like variable speed drives, which can be an upgrade to your HVAC system, can have a payback period of just a couple years, can be between two, two and a half years, which is pretty compelling. Uh, if you look in the industry, you see a lot of variable speed drive retrofits. Lighting can be compelling as well. It can be a, a, a couple years payback, especially moving to LEDs. Uh, I was at a conference a couple weeks ago, and a lot of organizations that have very large warehouses were looking at, at LEDs because you typically have huge lighting loads. You have very big warehouses. You have to have very bright lights, and you have you know they're not only are they square footage, but vertically there's usually very high ceilings uh, to hold a lot of equipment. So they have very bright lights. Uh, but I would say that there are some improvements. Uh, thinking back to the, the HVAC upgrade uh, that we discussed in our case study, where they they paid the project back within the first year. Um, the grant was 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 not nearly as expensive, or was not the, the grant that they were awarded did not was not nearly as much money as, as they made made back over that that first year of the project. Uh, and so sometimes it can it, you can have more compelling paybacks. Additionally, there can be no cost, low cost uh, improvements. One of the, 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 the simplest things that you can do, and we find this every day, is building schedules. So when is your building starting up? When is your building shutting down? And across your portfolio, do you really understand when that's happening? Do you have the data you need to assess? My building starts up at 6 a.m. People come in at 7. That would make sense. But are there some buildings that start up at 4 in the morning and uh, you know people don't come in until 8? There's a building uh, that we work with that actually saved about three thousand uh, dollars over the course of a year, simply by changing the set point for their building on Monday mornings. Their building was starting up very early in the morning, and while they could have logged into the building automation system to find this scheduling um, inefficiency and changed it, they didn't have real good access, and the, the the system didn't have the tools that they needed to really identify this. Within Building LS, within the first couple days, they they identified an issue, they changed it, and that change was literally a five-minute change of one facility uh, individual, and they saved $3,000. So for that, the payback period is, is you know, it's less than, I'm not even sure how you would time that, because the time it took to, to change it, the staff time, was less than what, what they saved. Um, you know, so they're paying that project back within the first day or two. Yeah, and I'll jump in real quick on that. For, for metrics, our, our, the, the simple paybacks that we look for um, are sort of in that seven to ten year range, which would our, our ESA terms are usually in the um, seven to, to ten year uh, ESA term. Uh, we can go as long as fifteen uh, or twenty. When in some you know rare instances where um, where there's some some other access to, to funding on the back end, um, we can go over fifteen. But uh, so a seven to ten year ESA term would be a project with a sort of five to seven year simple payback. Um, so it's it's those larger, deeper projects. It's the HVACs, it's the you know the big chillers and boilers and, and drives and pumps, motors, things like that um, that may have longer payback times than what you would want to use your cash for. So our typical paybacks are um, you know in the upper single digit range. Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Joe. Uh, okay, I think we have time for about one more question, and that involves uh, multi-site projects. Uh, and uh, we had a question here in terms of, you had mentioned initially that some of these savings, or these proven savings can be used, obviously, to hopefully fund future projects. But in terms of a of when you first set out, it, do you normally do multi-site, or do you, does it depend on the, the organization in terms of you might want to just you might want to recommend one building at a time or one campus at a time and then move from there 
um, or what's been your experience with that? Doug, would you like to start and then I'll add a couple comments? Sure. Um, so we've, we've done it both ways uh, with customers where we've taken the systematic approach of, of one sort of campus at a time on a large industrial client of ours. Um, we have, we've done five campuses of theirs now throughout the U.S. Um, and then we have folks where, where we would do large rollouts all at the same time um, throughout the U.S. at multiple facilities. So it's really customer preference where we can scale either way if the customer would like to. And, and again, being, you know, Metris for the most part is, is ESCO agnostic. So as long as the ESCO or ESCOs or the project can scale um, and, and handle multiple projects at once, we're open to doing multiple projects at once. The, the beauty of the ESA, though, is it is um, in place and new projects can be added to it. So if a customer does one facility now and another facility later, um, and then one, you know, two or three years down the road, it, it can still fall under that that original terms and conditions of the ESA. So, so the bulk of the work is is sort of knocked out. Um, so yeah, either way, that the, that's really customer preference for us as far as single site um, at a time or multi site all at once. I'll just add real briefly that uh, it, it is very much a, a, a preference. Uh, thinking back to the, the point we made understand the the appetite for energy efficiency projects within your organization, I think that's the best way to answer that question. Uh, if you have an organization that's been doing energy efficiency projects, has seen some success, but may not have real quantifiable evidence of the projects, and, and they, then you could go multi-site. In other cases, a pilot project picking one building that is either the highest consumer of energy and highest cost for energy, or a, a, a couple buildings that have uh, drift or that you can see are moving in the wrong direction, you may want to start small uh, with a pilot, prove out the savings, prove out the return, uh, use that to tell a story to get more funding. So it really uh, is, is where doing some research, talking to different individuals, understanding why projects have been done in the past or have not been done in the past really will help you identify should you do a pilot with one building or a couple buildings nearby, could you go uh, wide. Uh, from our point of view, like, like Doug, there's no limitations within the software. Um, you can group buildings across the nation into a project. Maybe you're doing retrofits uh, of similar kind across the, the nation. You can group them together. You can measure them. You can get all the information you need and tell that story. You can do it all from the, the seat of your desk, just logging into the cloud. Or you can look at one particular site and, and just focus your efforts. Thank you, Joe. Uh, OK, well, it looks like we're out of time. I'd like to thank all our attendees for their attention and attendance today. Um, and thank you, of course, to Joe and Doug for the presentation. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available online at facilityexecutive.com shortly, as well as on Lucid's website, which is lucidenergy.com. So thanks again, Joe and Doug and our attendees, and to Lucid for sponsoring the webinar. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.